Jackie Russo, Dan Regard. Today we're going to talk about IDS and Dan's vision for where we're going. Dan, welcome to the show. Jackie, it's so nice to be here. I mean, after all this time of working with you remotely, right? to be in person is a pleasure and uh, I'm really looking forward to this time. Well, we're glad to have you here. So let's start with IDS. Where did the vision come from in the company? I know we're really talking conferences today, but I think we always start with the beginning. So talk to me about the vision of what you thought it would be and what it's become. Well, originally, I mean, the vision for IDS, like many of the things that we go through our chapters are based on what came before. And before joining IDS, I had had my own company, then I worked with a, a fabulous uh, group Deloitte and Touche, then with FTI Consulting, then LECG, and really had seen what I thought was at the time the best of what large consulting had to offer and the challenges. And the challenges I felt really were, it was a sink or swim attitude. They, they hired great people, put them out there for consulting, and let them go. Right. And I always felt that we could do better if we built a platform to help people uh, excel at what they do well at, but not try to find somebody who could be simultaneously a business developer, a engagement um, initiator, a subject matter expert, a project manager, and a specialist in collections. It seemed like it a lot to ask for. I mean, pick a lane. So, so IDS really was conceived of as a platform for consulting experts. And we've evolved from that to see, to, to, to show that a better infrastructure really is better for the overall group. And, and now we've, we've also grown from a collection of individual experts to a company that has experts in it. So much less swim in your own swim lane, right. much more collaborative work on projects. Right, so talk to us about the projects you work on. What does that collaboration look like? What kind of work are you doing for people? Well, we're, we're still doing projects that are focused on individual expertises, such as uh, responding to a global cybersecurity incidents, incidents response. We're working on advising a global software company on information governance and information management. Uh, we're working on small cases involving a few litigants where there's, or large, where there are questions of the authenticity of evidence. And so we come in to validate or show that evidence has been faked or manipulated. We work on uh, class actions and antitrust matters on large sets of documents or large sets of data and doing anal data analytics to reflect back on activities, pricing activities, uh, meetings, collaborations, what some people might allege to be collusion, whether or not that uh, occurred or didn't. Right. And uh, But one of the cases, for example, I think that exemplifies our cross-pollination. We worked a large uh, case, allegations of theft of intellectual property on an international basis, and we came in and provided a cybersecurity assessment as to whether or not information was properly protected to be considered trade secrets. Mm -hmm. We did a forensics investigation as to whether or not there was evidence of data being exfiltrated or stolen mm -hmm. from company A to company B. Uh, we came in and looked at data base records on manufacturing processes to see whether or not alleged uh, theft of recipes were actually being used in the manufacturing process. Wow. And you could actually look at the uh, kilns and the manufacturing equipment, which was largely computer driven, and you could see based on the data whether or not they were following the processes that they were accused of stealing. Mm -hmm. Or even if they thought they had stolen them, right. were they even using them? Right. So it was kind of amazing to bring those multiple disciplines together. And then we also advised on e-discovery best practices. And uh, it was a, really a, a, a full-featured opportunity for us and for the client. That's fascinating. It's like your own little James Bond movie. I, well, I didn't think of it that way, but it's, this stuff's kind of exciting. It is. I mean, we got calls this weekend on some really high-profile um, executive uh, investigations. Mm-hmm. And we hopped into action. We got called on Friday night, and we answered the phone, and, and everyone spins into gear, and it's kind of exciting. I mean, it, but that's, you know, we say sometimes when you're in litigation, you're in the fireman business. Mm -hmm. you, you're not in the, in the um, fire prevention business. Right, right. It's all reaction. Right. Not planning. 
Let's talk about it because you said the word process a couple times and I know that's one of the things that makes IDEA special and unique. Talk to us about the steps process, how that came to be and how that works. So as we started to grow, we realized that not everybody has the same skills when it comes to project management, but that project management was key not only to individual projects, but to providing consistent quality and service to our clients across the board. So we, we looked outside of the organization for leadership, advice, and direction on project management. And as most people do, we came across the project management book of knowledge or body of knowledge, PMBOK. And we brought on some PMP uh, certified individuals and we started developing a project execution framework. But then we realized even though many projects can have similar characteristics, we have projects at IDS that are somewhat different because we deal with evidence, we deal with testimony, we deal with litigation, and we deal with data. Because of these four aspects, we inserted into the PMBOK project execution life cycle characteristics that are important for us and for our clients, and we memorialize that into a book, our own body of knowledge, the IDS PMBOK, if you will, the IDS OCK. And this we named STEPS, and it's a six-phase project execution handbook for us to follow that we invite our clients to participate in. It allows us, again, to make sure we think of early mm -hmm. some of those decisions that make a big impact later in the case. It also ensures that we consistently consistently use best practices. If we learn something new, and we learn something on every case, we can build it into our processes so we leverage that the next time we have a case. Our clients love it. They say that it gives them a sense of comfort that we have a plan, we're following the plan, we're not afraid to deviate from it, but we have a starting point that's best. And I, I, I hear all the time, given a choice between two great teams, would you rather a team that wings it, or would you rather a team that has a plan? We got a plan. We call it steps. Right. You know, it makes me think about football, right? And so I think the football teams that are best prepared are the ones that have practiced right, put the great plans in, done good scouting reports, but also can make those mid-game adjustments. And I feel like that's what steps does for you. It allows you to have the right process, but adapt to the situation. Well, uh, imagine a football team without a playbook. Right. What are we going to do? You run down field, I'm going to throw the ball to you. That's not quite as good as a plan that you've rehearsed right. for a screen pass. Right, right. Jet sweep. Everybody's got to do their thing. Um, I think so. Now, what amazes me about what you've done and what IDS continues to do is the way you use your subject matter expertise and take it out into the community. And I think you do that through a lot of conferences. So talk to me about the most recent conferences that you've been to and how those worked for y'all. Well, first of all, we should all realize that we've had no conferences for two years. We've had virtual conferences, and we've participated, uh, not actively, I would say we participated vigorously in these conferences. But recently, thanks to vaccinations and to stronger protocols, we had a first round of in-person conferences. The uh, eDiscovery Institute, which is EDI, the... Um, Sedona Working Group 1 had its annual in Cleveland. EDI was in Santa Barbara. And then we participated in the Georgetown Advanced eDiscovery Institute at, uh, well, not at Georgetown campus, but in Washington, D.C. And all three were fantastic. It was really great to see the community come out mm -hmm. and get back together. Uh, there, there's no strong substitute for, for having a conference where the audience can give immediate feedback to the speakers and redirect the conversation toward what's in the room right. and then immediately carry that conversation out into the hallway, into the common areas, and continue the dialogue. So that ability to redirect and also the ability to continue after the fact, you just can't replace. Right. It was fantastic. And, and, and we're privileged to be invited to some of these. We were honored to participate in some of these. And um, with Georgetown and to a lesser degree with Sedona and certainly with EDI, we're able to help plan some of the sessions or with Georgetown plan a significant portion of the um, program mm -hmm. and the precursor events leading up to the program. This year we had four different sessions for uh, beginners for eDiscovery, the eDiscovery 101 series. We had guest law firms and really great subject matter experts teach courses on different aspects of discovery, 
and we helped facilitate that. And it was just really wonderful. So for the community, for the education, for the experience, uh, everyone goes to conferences for those reasons. It's nice to see that we still didn't lose that touch. Right, right. I think that a lot of people in your position, subject matter experts, leaders in what they do, are often very hesitant to share their knowledge. Uh, they want people to know they're smart, but they don't want to give away the trade secrets. They feel, I see a very proprietary hours. Um, I see you and, and the team at IDS being very generous with your time and with your knowledge. What's the difference for you? Why are you so comfortable teaching classes, helping others become experts in the industry as well? You know, I, I think we have a level of comfort that I can tell you all the ingredients for a successful project and I can tell you some tricks that we've learned along the way you're still going to need 10 or 15 years of experience to really make that gel. Um, uh, you know, we talk a lot about our love for food in Louisiana. I can give you my recipe for gumbo, and it's going to be an accurate recipe. But if you haven't made 20 gumbos or 200 gumbos, it's not going to taste the same. Right. So I'm, we're not afraid that we're giving away the secret sauce because you can't give away 20 years of experience. Right. At the same time... Um, I think that some of the cases we've worked on have been landmark cases mm -hmm. and there are lessons to be learned. And more importantly, when we go to these conferences and they talk about a case like diisocyanates or they talk about Rossback, which was this uh, sanctions case in New York State Southern District. Unless you know the background story, they're only giving it a superficial treatment. Mm -hmm. This case was in the Southern District of New York. And the plaintiff's case was dismissed, and the judge awarded sanctions against the plaintiff, her lawyer, and his law firm. That's big news. It's a cautionary tale. But understanding how the strategy laid out to make that a possibility, how the evidence was presented in a way that gave the judge an ability to personally take it upon herself to become the, the trier of fact, uh, the way that we set up the dramatic effort that was required to falsify this evidence those are the lessons. And so just talking about the outcome doesn't really teach what I think are the big issues. And, and there are a lot of big issues to learn from these cases. So we like sharing the knowledge. We like trying to determine what is that abstract, higher level perspective mm -hmm. and, and what characteristic of this case is actually applicable to other cases. Right. You know, you touched on the role that the judge played in one of the cases. To me, it seems like so much of your job right now is educating judges and other attorneys because as technology changes, people have to learn a lot to adapt and change with it. Well, there's no question. We've, we've often described ourselves as translators, helping to bridge the gap between the legal experts and the technology experts. And, and our role is to be that middle person also, and you bring up a great point, technology is rapidly evolving. That's the nature of technology. Things are changing so fast in the world around us. What we've learned is if you have a challenge with a particular type of technology that's just come out, there is nobody with 10 years of experience with those things. The, the iPhone is 10 years old, 11 years old. So if you're looking for a 15-year expert on the iPhone, doesn't exist. If you're looking for a 10-year expert on the iPhone 13, doesn't exist. So we have to learn how to rapidly assess new technologies and, and still form a hypothesis, test the hypothesis, present the results of that, interpret the results of that to the judge, the jury, the trier of fact. And so we look at it now as a process of how can we become experts at becoming experts? Mm -hmm. And that's our response to this rapid evolution. All right. As an expert witness, which I know you and your team are called in to do quite often, um, how much pressure is that on you to get it right? <laughs> uh, well, professionally, we always want to get it right. Sure. I don't know if I would call it pressure. Okay. I would call it, it's our goal, it's our objective. Right. It is what we always shoot for. Uh, occasionally, we make mistakes. Sure. And, and there, our... Experience has taught us you own the mistakes um, and you fix them. Right. But with that in mind, if you have that attitude in mind, I think that you, you do your homework, you present what you know, you don't present what you don't know, right. don't get uh, lured out onto thin ice, and, um, and, and you can still give strong testimony, 
you can present strong results without going beyond what you're supposed to go beyond because you haven't done that work yet. Right. That's important. Right. Um, I think uh, sometimes the ego would probably drive some people in the wrong direction. And that's what I've noticed a lot with you and your team is I don't see a lot of ego. I see a lot of people who are here to get it right, um, not to guess. Well, um, we reinforce with ourselves the need to be objective mm -hmm. and to be true, um, unbiased experts. Mm -hmm. I, I, I certainly think the team has some ego. I think they're very proud of what they've accomplished. Sure. But the, the, the group pride, the pride of having a great company, having great successes, is a little bit different than the personality ego that says, I can't right. be wrong and I'm right, right just because I'm me. Right. And you want to cite an author you want to cite a authority for why I'm right? I'm gonna cite myself. That's not us. <laughs> Okay, we like to actually do the work. Right, right. That is my point. Um, being at the top of the list of the world's best now for a few times in a row, um, what kind of pressure does that bring for y'all to always bring that A game and stay at the top of the list? Um, well, we didn't build that list. Sure. And uh, we weren't even aware that the list was being created when it was created. I'm going to give you an answer you may not expect. Okay. It's horrible. I would think so. The reason it's horrible is because I don't feel like we've finished growing. Right. And I think we have a lot more left to learn. And I turn to other people and they say, oh, no, you're already at the top. I'm, I'm not at the top. Right. I feel like we're at the very beginning. We've crossed the foothills. Mm -hmm. We still have Mount Everest to climb. And if you think the rest of the crowd is in front of us, behind us, on the side of us, that's not what defines where we are and what mm -hmm. drives us. And so what we're doing, the reason we're working with Brand Russo and... The reason we work with other outside consultants and advisors, we're looking for ways to do what we do much, not a little bit, much better than we're doing it today. Right. So um, if, if these accolades bring us new challenges and new clients, it's great. If it gives us a false sense of we've finished and we can now stop, right. it's horrible. <laughs> What's the next Everest going to look like for you? Oh. Uh, so we, we live in a world where even after 20, 25 years of dealing with data, uh, as an industry, the legal practice still hasn't got their arms around the full capabilities right. of how data can help us resolve disputes. And, and I look forward, I think that for all we've done in the last 25 years with email and technology, we have more change in front of us mm -hmm. than we have behind us. And, and that is the Everest. It's, it's how do you... Teach people to appreciate, to collect, to understand how to interpret this data, what it means. It's super exciting. It, it, I feel like my career is starting over, right. and I'm, I'm just jazzed every single day. It's a shame you don't bring more energy and passion to your job. I, I wish I could find that magic pill. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so in terms of company growth, y'all have expanded. You've opened new offices. You've brought on new people. What are those next steps for you going to look like next year? So... Um, We've developed this steps process. We've started to formalize project execution. We can now train to it. We can measure to it. We can uh, monitor it. This was all intentional. We have a lot of other smaller changes behind the scenes. I won't bore you with the details. But the question is, we have if we have 50 people, <coughs> the question is, mm -hmm. if we have 50 people who know how to do this work and do it well, but the world needs five thousand people who could do this and do it well. How do we grow our capabilities? How do we scale from 50 to somewhere bigger than 50? Right. Not 5,000 no. today, but we want to grow. And so our challenge is how do we continue to build the, the infrastructure? How do we operationalize our procedures? How do we build specialty uh, talents within the company so that we can grow right. and grow with that level of quality and consistency? That's the challenge. It's a, it's, I was describing this morning, it's a shift from thinking like Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. inventive, to Tim Cook, operational. How do you move from a great product to a great product that's available to everybody? Right, right. Well, and I think that ties in nicely with how you've been growing. You are making yourselves more accessible and available as you continue to add more capacity. It's, it's adding more capacity and then learning how do we bring that capacity and and in, in, in not indoctrinate, but how do we include them 
How do we incorporate them into our processes? Right. So A, they bring something new, but B, we bring in the infrastructure and the execution. Right. What's the question that I should have asked but didn't? Why Lafayette? Why would we bring our whole team to Lafayette for an entire week? Well, I know it's the food, so I don't even have to ask. Why Lafayette? You know, uh, everyone asks, where are you today and where did you come from? Right. I came from Louisiana. I got my computer science training in Louisiana. I, I was raised and all of my formative years were in Louisiana. My early computer designs were done at Phoenix Computers right off Pinhook. I was a volunteer at USL when I was still in college. Oh, I like you threw the S in there. When I was still in high school. Well, USL, right. yeah. That's, I, we had an S when I was there too. And uh, I went to computer science there. I started my first accounting courses there. I later went to Tulane, but it's part of Louisiana as well for my law. And uh, I just have great um, foundation here. And I've used a lot of my Louisiana background to build communities when I go other places. We were talking about conferences. We had a big conference in Belgium three years ago. It was fantastic. I told everybody to stay an extra night, and they did. And we borrowed a house of one of the local participants, and we went and cooked a big etouffee. Oh. Now, that's community. Mm -hmm. No matter where you go, mm -hmm. we cook a good meal, we bring people together. You can't say no to that. I would so I decided to bring my executive team here to Louisiana, here to Lafayette, to see where it all began. We're gonna be meeting with the university, we're meeting with my family, we're meeting with my marketing team, and we're meeting together. Right. So it's a win, win, win. Right. And you're eating a lot of good food. Uh, that is a fact. I had ball crabs last night. Oh. I had a good breakfast at the cafeteria this morning. I just had a pull boy from Old Time Grocery. It's already winning. Right. It's a good day. It's a great day. Dan, thanks for being here. Jackie, it's a real pleasure. Thank you for the hospitality and an opportunity to speak to our audience. Thank you. Thank you. you.